Adrian van Oostade is an artist that worked during the Dutch Golden Age, which is the 17th century. He was very prolific, and hundreds of his works still survive, as well as about 50 etchings that are known today. What he's really known for are his genre scenes, but this is a very different type of genre scene than most people think about when they think about the Dutch Golden Age. Instead of the genre scenes of mothers and families and tidy, well-kept homes, Van Ostada was known for his peasant scenes that are rowdy and boisterous and full of bad behavior. As we look at his work, you will see a few different influences at play. He spends some time in Utrecht, but then he spends some time in Harlem, and we think that this is during the time when Halls painted a portrait of Van Ostada, which we're seeing here. While he's in Harlem, some think that he was a student of Halls, even though we don't really have enough contemporary records to prove this. Either way, we do definitely see Halls playing an influence in Van Ostada's style. We're going to see a lot of Franz Halls kind of vivacious, dynamic action coming into what Van Ostada does. Van Ostade, while he's in Harlem, was a member of the Guild of St. Luke, so he definitely knew Halls. There are other artists, though, that influence his work. We're going to see him using a type of subject matter, these low-life kind of peasant scenes that are very much inspired by what Adrian Brower and David Teniers were doing. We're also going to see that he's influenced, especially in light and shading, by Rembrandt. So he's most known for his scenes of cottage life, peasant life, festivals. He does also do those some portraits and some still lifes, and even some of those head and shoulder studies we call tronies. Throughout these different works, the style that we most often see in Van Ostade is characterized by really lively humor that is bordering on the side of kind of callous rowdiness. We're going to see a lot of coarse figures, lower class figures acting in unattractive and sometimes even ridiculous ways. We're going to see that he uses a painterly brush stroke, but it's not like the painterly brush stroke of Rembrandt. Instead, it's really thinly applied. Sometimes you can even see the grain of the wooden panel underneath his brushwork. So very different from the thick paint of Rembrandt's painterly stroke. He does, though, like Rembrandt, use a lot of chiaroscuro and tenebrism, lots of contrasts of light and dark, uh, which is very characteristic of the Baroque overall. His works really seem to exude a sense of atmosphere. The atmospheric effects there are really wonderfully captured, and that is something that many historians associate with his time in Harlem. It's a place where there is actually a lot of humidity in the air, so it would have been something that he would have observed when he lived there. On the whole, though, his works are populated by rougher figures, marked by kind of adversity, uh, cluttered types of scenes that aren't necessarily clean and well-mannered. So he's really kind of taking a different tact in comparison to some of the other artists of the Dutch Republic during the Golden Age. However, one thing that's really kind of interesting is to note that after mid-century, Van Ostada's works do take a slightly different turn. His figures become a little more respectable, a little less coarse. The spaces look a little more refined, a little wealthier, a little more comfortable. Sometimes he even captures kind of a more poetic mood in those later works. So he's not going to be immune from the trends forever. While his early works really are kind of rowdy, and humorous and loud, his later works sometimes start to follow that trend of gentrification, of civility, of refinement, uh, of gentility. And we'll talk about how this actually relates to trends in contemporary literature that start to portray a cultural shift about mid-century in attitudes towards the peasantry. The first example we're looking at here is from 1635, Carousing Peasants in an Interior. This is a smaller work. It's about 11 and a half by 14 inches, and it really shows his characteristic early style. First of all, we see that really rough brushwork. It's thinly applied paint. It's sketchy. It's painterly. And it kind of adds to that sense of action and movement that we see here that's part of the composition. So we get that painterly brush stroke that implies movement. We get the movement of the figures within the composition. We get some of these diagonal lines in the composition. It all makes it seem very active. 
the figures are characteristic of Venostata as well. Really rough figures. They almost seem to be caricatures sometimes, but they're very unflattering depictions of peasants. They're low life. They're churlish. They're almost like bestial in a way that they really don't control their tempers or their appetites, but instead just give in to every whim. The interior kind of reflects the same sort of disorder. Right? Really poor kind of interior, very simple, very rough not clean, not organized, not put together. But overall, we really do see some of those characteristics of tenebrism, those contrasts of light and dark, and the sense that there is a thick, heavy kind of air here, that there's atmosphere here. So those elements that are most characteristic of Venostad are here in style, as well as in the subject matter that he's portraying and his approach to that subject matter. Now, it's really common in the 30s for him to show peasants in this way, and it really parallels what's happening in contemporary literature. Very often, peasants there were used as examples of bad behavior. It was really satirical. It was very much ironic. It was meant to be humorous while at the same time being moralizing, warning viewers against acting in the same way, or viewers would be the ones thought of as churlish and bestial and uh, really just not knowing how to live up to the social codes of the day. There are other connections here to contemporary literature, specifically proverbial types of saying that were very often published in books. You can see the cards, you can see the jugs, uh, and there was this very common proverb that said cards, jugs, and stockings make a man poor. So we can kind of see how that connects here with the subject matter that we're seeing. The other thing that we have to realize is that for viewers that saw these works, for patrons, what was the appeal? There definitely was some of that moralization that was appealing, right? A, a recommendation for how viewers should live a life that is very different from what they're seeing here. But there's another kind of aspect that many scholars talk about to the enjoyment of these images. And it would have been a way for a lot of patrons who had enough money to buy these works. And we have to remember the Dutch Republic has that really large middle class Many people had experienced some social mobility and moved up from the lower classes into the middle class, and they're trying to fit in to that new upper middle class life that they have and their new social station. When they look at the bad behavior here, it was a way for them to feel superior. It was a, may, a way for them to feel that they had assimilated into the upper middle class successfully in contrast to the figures they see here with these bad examples of behavior, not knowing how to follow the rules and how to be refined and how to have good manners. Not all of his portrayals are so unflattering though. In the mid-century, we start to see more more trends moving art toward more refined kinds of interiors, more refined kinds of figures, more um, positive kinds of portrayals of, of peasants. There's a couple of things going on with that. We do have to just understand that gentrification was occurring, right? We had that social mobility as people made a lot of wealth through trade. They came up into the upper middle classes. They wanted to know how to behave. They wanted to be instructed. They wanted art to reflect those kinds of instructions and model good behavior so that they could follow in the footsteps of the art they saw as well as the contemporary literature they read. So part of these more positive representations can be understood in terms of gentrification. We also have to understand that uh, as we move into the 60s, so a little bit after this point in time, we're going to start to see French tastes really influencing the, the trends in Dutch art for elegance and refinement and wealth and opulence in, in the works. And so when we're starting to see him in the 60s move to something that's more positive, we have to understand too that it might have been his way of trying to kind of follow that trend in a limited way, trying to move away from the things that were incredibly unflattering and move towards something that was a little more in line with the expectations of the time. It could just be that that preference for French taste really tempered Van Ostada's kind of rivalrous nature. The peasants here in prayer before meal are really shown as being wholesome and virtuous and living a clean and simple life where they're focusing on their children and focusing on teaching them the things to do correctly. And that's a really kind of positive way to look at the peasantry. This is something that we see happening in mid-century. Texts start to mark a change in the outlook, outlook rather, towards peasants. 
they really start to be seen as virtuous figures that are the basis for the nation. People who lived in the city, urban dwellers, saw peasants as living kind of unburdened, simpler lives. Um, and it is kind of a sly way for them to feel super, superior, right, as someone who is kind of urbane, unknowing. But it was also something that was really positive in terms of the attitudes towards the work that the peasants did to keep the nation going and fed and operating on its full scale. This last example, his interior of a peasant's cottage dates from 1668 and really shows how his style changed in later decades. He's got a more refined technique here, more subtle chiaroscuro rather than the stark tenebrism, and he really starts to explore the contrast of light and dark in his etchings and starts to incorporate those same explorations into his painting. He's using more local color, he's really arranged things in a more orderly fashion in contrast to his earlier works. And the figures are less coarse. The figures aren't quite so animal-like as the earlier examples. So it's definitely an improvement in terms of the positivity associated with these figures. But when you contrast that with some of the artists um, that are really reflecting a strong influence from France in their works, you can see how Van Ostada is a little bit different. Terborg and Dow are two good examples of artists who are following after the greater calls for refinement and elegance as Dutch artists started to reflect greater French interests and Dutch culture started to reflect greater interest in French tastes. When you look at these two works in comparison with Van Ostade, you can see that definitely Van Ostade is not taking it to the same level. However, it's definitely an improvement in contrast to how he showed humanity and figures in his earlier works. Instead of focusing on the bad behavior as a moralizing lesson, he really starts to focus in on more positive kinds of behavior. The figures here are still humble. They are still peasants. The setting here is still humble, but there is this sense that they are positively shown. They're the cornerstones, the foundations of Dutch society. It really reflects the whole notion uh, that we see in contemporary literature of this time. It also reflects the notions that we see coming from texts like Jakob Katz, where domestic tranquility in the home is something that's really emphasized that a happy peasantry with happy homes will support the urban society. So we're seeing a more peaceful domestic scene here. So it's good behavior to emulate rather than his earlier works that showed bad behavior to avoid. In terms of style, he still has those atmospheric effects. He's still using a painterly brush stroke that's a little sketchy and a little thinly applied. Those are things that continue on through both phases. This last example from around 1672 shows again that positive portrayal of the peasant rather than the earlier negative portrayal of the peasant. Uh, in 1672, Van Ostad had to flee Harlem because the French had invaded the Netherlands. So there's really this nostalgia for the independent Dutch Republic happening at this point in time. There's an even greater appreciation for the Dutch peasantry and the way that they had contributed to a strong nation in the midst of this French invasion. So Fishwives, interesting, it kind of had a reputation for being like noisy and domineering. Um, and still we even have some kind of connotation like that today but when we look at the fishwife pictured here we really don't get any of those kinds of of moods or messages portrayed instead she seems really calm she seems hard working she seems like she's someone who's useful to society she seems virtuous and she seems like she's doing all the things that are admired in dutch women at the time She's cleaning her fish. She's getting ready to sell it on the market. Uh, she's standing in this traditional looking kind of stall. We see a lot of these kind of market scenes portrayed in Dutch painting as part of the genre scene showing everyday life. Uh, and not only is she a good kind of staple of Dutch society, but salmon was also kind of a staple of Dutch diet uh, in those days. It was a food that was even nutritious and affordable to the poor people. So all these kind of positive associations coming through here that really reflect the way Van Ostada kind of turned his subject matter around in his later phases.